Hi everyone, Krista Cowan here with another episode of the Barefoot Genealogist. Today we are talking about browsing records. Now we've talked about this topic before, so the first part of our presentation today is going to be a review. But for those of you who haven't joined us before, this, this could be some really brand new information for you. Let me just kind of set it up a little bit. Most of you are familiar with those little shaky leaves that show up on your tree that tell you that Ancestry.com has discovered some records about your family. What some of you aren't aware of is that that's not all the records that exist for that person in your tree. Ancestry.com only hints about the top 10% of our most popular databases. We just give you those hints as a way to get you started. Now keep in mind they are just hints. You do still have to review that information to make sure if it fits what you know about your family. And if it doesn't, then you need to ignore it if you're sure it's not your person or just leave it there until you gather some more information or until you're able to look at some additional records to make a decision. So the shaky leaf hint is the first step. The second step is actually searching the records. Most of you know about how to search and I've done several videos on that um, and I hope that you are searching. There are a lot of records, in fact more than 13 billion of them, available on Ancestry.com and your ancestor could very well be in several of those collections. This is kind of a step beyond that, okay? So you've got your shaky leaf hints, you've got your records that you discover through searching. Now what we're gonna talk about today is browsing records. And there's two reasons that we're gonna cover why you want to browse records. Then we're gonna talk about how to do it, and then I will show you um, one of the new features that we have on Ancestry.com that's gonna make attaching those records that you discover through browsing a little bit easier. So let's go ahead and dive in. Let's talk first about why you might want to browse records. Uh, one of the things that most uh, experienced genealogists understand is that when you go, when you find a record, it's not enough to just look at that singular record that it takes you to when you click search and then find the record and click through to it. Very often you need to understand what the record collection is that you're looking at how those records are organized, what additional information you can glean. The information about your ancestor may not be the only information available in that set of records. And so understanding how they're organized uh, very often comes through browsing those records. Now, some of you know that you've searched and searched and searched and not been able to find an ancestor. And so browsing records is another way to discover things that search does not surface or does not um, give you. So for example, if you know that you found your family in the 1920 census and you found them in the 1940 census and they're living at the same address in both censuses but you cannot find them in 1930, well, you could browse directly to that address and look for your family that way, uh, as opposed to being able to search for them. And then the big reason that we're gonna talk about today for why browsing is important is that not all records are indexed. On Ancestry.com, we put records up um, as quickly as we can. We digitize those images. Sometimes it's from microfilm. Sometimes it's original copies of records. Sometimes those records come to us already digitized, those images. Indexing those records, meaning having somebody go through and type in every name and date and location off of a particular record so that you can search for them is a very, very costly and very time intensive process. And so rather than hold on to these records until we can get them through that process, Ancestry.com has made a decision with a lot of these collections to just put these records online now so that you can access them even if they're not searchable. So these are the kinds of records that we're talking about. These are records that will never surface in a search because there is no index that has been created yet. So let's talk about where you're going to find these records. You're going to want to use the card catalog always, always, okay? If you've spent any time with me, you know how important the card catalog is to me in my research. You're going to find the card catalog by hovering over the search button. Card catalog is the very bottom option on the menu that comes up. Click that and it's going to take you to this page that's going to show you that Ancestry.com currently has 32,263 databases 
And of course, that number grows every day as Ancestry.com adds new records. Now, the default sort for this particular list is by popularity. You can change that to sort it alphabetically or to sort it by the, the date added so that the newest records are at the top. Here we have a collection of records that were just added yesterday. Um, actually, I think we may even have um, several from this week, uh, several databases added just this week. So you can see the new stuff at the top of the list. Now, like I mentioned, a lot of the new stuff on Ancestry.com, um, we're just trying to get these records out here, so a lot of it is going to be what we call um, browse only or image only. So you're going to find it in the card catalog. In the card catalog, besides being able to sort that list, you can also filter that list. You can filter it by record type, by location, and by time period. So I can use these filters over here, and I can narrow my way down based on a record type, if I'm interested, for example, in passenger lists, and then let's say I'm interested in New York passenger lists, um, that just takes me right to this database. Okay, now let me just point out the, the New York passenger list database is fully indexed, okay? And so there is a search box here where you can search. But it also has this browse structure over here, Okay, so you can see browse this collection. Anytime there are images on Ancestry.com, you can browse those images. So if I couldn't find what I was looking for by searching, I could come over here and I could browse, and I can do that by date or by role. Okay, that's the original microfilm rolls from the National Archives. I'm gonna select date, and you'll notice now I get another pop-down, pop-up menu here where I can select the year, and so I can scroll my way down to a specific year, and then I can choose the month, and then I can choose the day, and then I can choose which ships came into New York Harbor on that day. And that will take me to a set of images. In this case, there's 99 of them. I don't know if you can see that down here in the center bottom of the screen where you can see my cursor moving. Okay, there's 99 images in this particular passenger list. This is the first image. There's some header information and then the passenger list begins. And I can use these arrows down here to just go through these images one by one looking for the information about my particular family. If I figure out that, oh, these are alphabetical or if I can, if after a few pages I realize there's a specific order to these, I can just type a number into this field and jump ahead to whichever image I would like to jump ahead to. So you can use this image, um, page forward and backward feature or type a number into that box to jump ahead or backwards. As I mentioned, you can do this with any collection on Ancestry.com for which there are images. Passenger lists, draft cards, census records, okay, tax rolls. I mean, I could go on and on, right? Lots of different kinds of records on Ancestry.com where there are images attached. Now, as I mentioned, some of the new collections do not have images attached. So we're going to look at some of those here in just a minute. And here's what's going to happen when you come across them. You're looking again for that browse this collection box that's going to be on the right hand side when you come across a specific database. Um, you're going to use those drop down menus to discover what the browse structure is or how those records are organized. And then when you find a specific section of images you're interested in, you can use those arrows or that number box to go image by image through those records. So let me give you an example of a browse only collection. These records were just recently placed on Ancestry.com. As a matter of fact, I think if I look here, type in Nevada. Okay, so if I was interested in Nevada records and I've got it sorted by date added, it's going to be the very first thing that comes up on the list. These records were added on Ancestry.com just two or three days ago um, on the 12th. Today's the 15th, so I guess that's three days ago. You'll notice when I come to this particular collection of records, there is no search box. Okay, these particular records have not yet been indexed, so they will never show up as a shaky leaf hint. They will never show up when you do a search. You have to use the card catalog to see if the kinds of records you're looking for exist. In this case, I'm looking for marriages from Nevada for this time period. And then I'm going to use this browse structure over here to find the set of images that's going to hold the record I'm interested in. So I'm going to come over here to choose the county. 
Okay, so let's say I'm interested in Clark County. And then you'll see here I have a couple of different things. First, I have an index to the marriage certificates. And then I have actual images of marriage certificates listed next. And those look like they go chronologically. Again, one of the purposes of browsing is to understand how records are organized. And so in this case, I can see these are organized chronologically. So I can work my way through to the specific year that I'm interested in. It's also interesting to note, and again, experienced genealogists understand that this kind of context is really useful. You'll notice here I've got one volume for marriages from 1928 through 1931. Another volume of marriages from 1931 to 1932. So presumably all of 1931 didn't fit in the book, and so they started a new book, right? Same thing with 32, and you'll notice a couple of years are doubled up, some years stand on their own. But then as we scroll down here, let me just make this a little bit bigger so you can see what I'm looking at here. As we scroll down here a little bit, look at what happens in 1941. 1941 is part of a book with 1940, and then there are several additional volumes of records of marriages in 1941. So as a genealogist, that automatically makes me want to think what happened in 1941 that all of a sudden increased the number of marriages happening in Clark County, Clark County being um, where Las Vegas is located. What happened in 1941? Uh, we know there was a war that began. Was there a change to the law? Okay, some of us are aware that Las Vegas is a place where um, you can go to get married quickly without any waiting period between the time you obtain your license and the time you can get married. Was there a change to the law? Was there some kind of a military base that was set up there? Was there, right? All of these are the kinds of questions that genealogists ask so that we can start to understand the context of why our ancestor may have been married in this time in this place. And again, you wouldn't figure that out or you wouldn't even see this in this kind of context unless you were looking at the records in this way. So really, really cool stuff starts to come out when you do that. So I can scroll down here and you'll see then um, after 1941, it looks like 1942 has a few volumes, but not nearly as many. 1943 has a few less, 44, 45, and then we kind of get into just two or three volumes um, per year until the end of the war when we have a whole bunch of 1947 volumes um, that happen. And so it's just really fascinating to me to look at the records in this way, even just to look at this browse structure. Okay, let's go ahead and click through to one of these. Um, these images, most of them um, from these image only or image first collections have come from Family Search. And so we're gonna load these images here. You'll notice again down here, 252 images in this volume. We've There's a picture here, an image here of the outside cover of the book so that you know what you're looking at. Uh, when you go to the next image, you're very often going to see um, some time period. Uh, so this says marriage certificates in book 24 um, cover July 11th, 1941 through July 31st of 1941. So if that's not the time period that you're interested in, rather than going all the way back to the database browse, you can use what we call this little um, breadcrumb trail here. You can actually click on that and it will pop up that browse structure again. And so I could then scroll back down to 1941 because really I'm not looking for a marriage in July, I'm looking for a marriage in August. If this is volume 24 and it ends the end of July, I need to check volume 25 for the next set of images. Okay, you see how that works? Just like looking through a set of books. So this is volume 25. Again, if I come to this next image, it should give me some kind of a range. It looks like these cover July 31st, 1941 through September 4th of 1941. So that's exactly the time period that I'm looking for. Um, I'm looking for something towards the end of August. So I'm actually going to use this number feature down here, type in page 180, jump towards the end. Looks like we are in the 17th of August, 16th of August. So I'm gonna jump again. Okay, and that's just how I browse the records. I don't have to go image by image, page by page through every one of them. I can jump ahead. Okay, now we're getting a little bit closer here. The 20, 20th, the 20th, 20th, it looks like the 20th of August. 
I'm looking for a marriage that took place on the 22nd of August. So now I can go page by page. And here's what, it, what it's looking like. Again, you're going to want to look at the records and see how they're organized. So yes, they are chronological, but they are chronological by the date that the record was filed, not the date that the marriage took place, okay? So all of these, it looks like, the, the 19th, the uh, 20th, all of these records, it looks like, were filed on the 4th of September, even though the marriage had taken place a couple of weeks earlier. So that's important to know because what it means is if you're looking for a marriage on August 21st, it could have been filed, you know, a day or two later, or it could have been filed a week or two later. Um, and you need to know how many pages you're going to have to browse through in order to find the record that you're looking for. Now, when you find the record that you're looking for, let's say this is, let's say this is it, okay? So here we've got this record here. Um, this is to certify that this person on the 18th of August, 1941, uh, joined this couple, um, Errol Von Temsky of Ontario, California, and Dorothy Esther Fattrell of Ontario, California. These two people were their witnesses. That's good information for genealogists. Um, and this guy was a justice of the peace that married them. And then, of course, it was filed on this day. Now, what if you want to save this record, okay? What if I have these people in my tree and I want to save this record to my tree? Well, there's no index, so it makes it a little trickier. This is the new feature that Ancestry.com just, just rolled out to help deal with these kinds of records. So I'm going to come over here to this orange Save button on the top right-hand corner. I'm going to click that, and I'm going to click Save to a person in your tree. It's going to pop out a little box here. Okay, um, Let me just pick somebody in my tree. Um, oh. Okay. So you pick the person in your tree that is for that the record is for, and then you're going to see additional boxes pop up. So the first thing you're going to choose is what event this is for. Well, in this case, it's a marriage event. Okay. Then you're going to type in how what information is on this record. So I would type in Errol, and his last name is Von Tempsky, and the marriage date. Remember, always pay attention to the difference between the marriage date and the filing date. You want to grab the marriage date. The marriage date is 8th August, 1941. The marriage occurred in Clark County, Nevada. Okay, select that. And then I can add a description. So I can say, you know, um, Errol was a resident of Ontario, California, as was his bride, Dorothy Esther Fattrell. Um, the witnesses were Robert S. Lee Jr. and Helen J. Redford. The marriage was uh, performed by B. Mullen Brown, Justice of the Peace in Las Vegas. Okay. And so you can add whatever inf additional information off that record you want to add and then click save and it will save both this information that you've just added and this image uh, to your tree just like it would any other indexed record. So when an index does not exist, basically what you're doing is you're creating one for the specific person that you are interested um, in attaching this record to your tree. That is, a, again, a new feature on Ancestry.com. I've had the opportunity to play around with it a little bit. It is super slick. Um, I really like that I can do that because um, very often I'd find some of these records, a lot of records on Ancestry.com that are image only, not just some new ones that we've added. But for example, we have some of the old Italian records. Um, indexing them ended up being a little trickier than we had planned. And so we wanted to still put them out there for you and make them available. And so um, it helps if I type in the right word, Italy. Um, and so we put them out there so that you could access them. But a lot of them are, again, this image first or image only um, kind of record collection. And so we still want you to be able to access them. So that is, um, that is uh, why you're going to want to browse records. 
That is where you're going to find them. And that is how you not only browse those records, but then when you find a record of interest, you attach it to the correct person in your tree so that that record then is attached um, both with some indexed information that you create on the fly and with a, the copy or the link to that particular image so that you can quickly access it again without having to go through that browse process a second time. Hopefully this was useful information. If you're watching this at our regularly scheduled time, I will be on chat immediately following the presentation to answer any additional questions you may have. And as always, if you have subjects or topics you'd like to see discussed, please send me an email at ask at ancestry.com and I'll be happy to include those in uh, our schedule for upcoming shows. Until next time, this is Krista Cowan. Have fun climbing your family tree.